Hello and welcome to Nudge, the only podcast dedicated to consumer psychology and behavioural science. If you're new here, then you should know that the Nudge helps marketers, salespeople and really anybody who needs to persuade somebody with tips that are proven to improve your work. In the shows, I chat to authors, researchers and pioneers who have helped us understand how the brain works and how to influence it. The Nudge is pretty much a brand new podcast, so if you like what you're hearing, please do go leave us a review on Apple. Reviews on there really make all the difference. In today's episode, we'll be looking at how the mind makes decisions. If I showed you two steaks and said that one contained 10% fat and that the other was 90% fat free, you'd probably pick the fat free version. But if you thought about it, you'd realise that they're in fact both the same. We slip up in scenarios like this because the majority of our thinking is conducted automatically by something called heuristics. Essentially, heuristics are shortcuts that allow us to make quick decisions without really thinking. My guest today is Dr. Alistair Good. He has studied the brain for over 25 years, focusing on implicit testing and advertising. He's now Chief Cognitive Scientist at Gorilla in the Room, a company which pioneers new research methodologies using virtual and augmented reality. Alistair's seen how our understanding of the brain and heuristics has changed dramatically over the past couple of decades. I'll hand over to him to explain that up until recently, we really had no idea what heuristics were. So 20 years ago, when I was an academic, I started making contact with some practitioners and one I contacted was the very well-respected and late great Virginia Valentine, who sent me her paper, which was called The Dark Side of the Onion. It described the brain as being like an onion, where you had sort of layers that you could peel away over time. And you started off with what people say, and then people how they say it, and then you're going back into what they did, etc. And then you got down to these deep subconscious thoughts, emotional subconscious thoughts in the middle. Um, As a cognitive scientist, I I found that rather interesting because I knew that to be completely wrong because it's all based on Freudian ideas um, or Freudian, Lacanian, Jungian type ideas. And all these psychodynamic theorists had the basic way they talked about the mind was as if you had your own mind, which was your brain, but then you had something called the homunculus, which is like a brain within a brain. And uh, Freud actually described three of them. And they had their own personalities, own ability to have memories, to make decisions, to to, uh, be able to reason in their own way. We know because we've done enough neuroscience now that that's not the way in which the brain works. I used to work with people who'd had closed head injuries. Um, That means that they've had part of their brain damaged and nobody's ever lost an id or an ego but they have kind of lost the ability to recognize, the ability to speak, the ability to write, the ability to do any other kind of, many other kind of tasks. Sigmund Freud's view of the mind was that there was a main brain which saw something and interpreted it as it was. For example, seeing a carrot and thinking, that's a carrot. But he also thought we had a subconscious mind that would see the same thing and interpret it differently, and usually quite sexually. The problem was that this view actually did very little to predict our behaviour or to explain the weird decisions we make. Instead, cognitive scientists developed a better understanding of how the brain worked by looking at how it evolved. Cognitive scientists view the mind today really in terms of evolution. The brain is around about 5% of body weight in total, yet it takes up about 20% of the amount of energy that's used. And having a brain is quite an energy inefficient thing and evolution doesn't like energy inefficiency so for it to evolve it had to learn how to use itself in the most energy efficient way it could we know that thinking is actually quite energy inefficient for example if you can imagine our ancestors out in the plains of africa millions of years ago and they were walking along and there was a kind of a a rustle in the bushes and something scary like a a predator jumped out and they, they escaped but then imagine the next time what would have to happen if they came along and they saw a rustle in the bushes. What does their brain have to do to keep them alive so that they can pass their genes on? But what it has to do, it has to do quickly. It has to do automatically without having to think about it. It has to do it in a way where you don't have to be aware of everything. You just have to be aware of enough. The view of neuroscience now is that the brain's primary job is to be a what happens next predictor. 
So in any situation, it's continually absorbing information, taking on board everything that's going on, and then constantly throwing out sensations about what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, and how the organism should be responding to that to successfully navigate its way through life. And I think we have a lot of these kind of automatic processes going on all of the time in everything that we do that guide our behavior quite dramatically, sometimes in ways that we're aware of and sometimes in, a ways, that we, in ways that we're not aware of. These automatic behaviours Ali talks about are heuristics. Heuristics dictate a lot of our decisions. In fact, research suggests that almost 40% of all of our decisions we make in life are dictated by these shortcuts. If you're anything like me, you're probably a little concerned when hearing that most of our actions are based on basically very little information and simple shortcuts. But perhaps we shouldn't be. Most heuristics end up being very accurate. Joe Marks and Steve Martin talk about this in their new book, Messengers. They mention a study where a group of people were given 50 photographs of CEOs to examine. Half of the participants were shown the CEOs of the top 25 highest ranking companies in the Fortune 1000, and the other half were shown the CEOs of the 25 lowest ranking companies. The participants were then asked to infer their personality characteristics. The results were astonishing. The faces ranked as most competent tended to be those of the most profitable and successful companies, and those ranked as least competent tended to be those of the worst companies. A similar result was found when asking five-year-old Swiss children to predict the outcome of the 2002 French parliamentary elections. When the kids were given a few seconds to select the winner, they were very accurate at predicting the eventual winners of the elections, even though they had no idea who the candidates were. But interestingly, when the kids were given more time, their ability to identify the winners was dramatically reduced. In other words, when they started thinking about the prediction and stopped using their heuristics, those predictions got much worse. Heuristics have evolved to be extremely good at their job, and it ultimately means that our gut instinct is usually pretty good. But it also means that we've allowed heuristics to start making more and more important decisions. In fact, there's evidence to suggest that they might dictate some of the biggest decisions in our lives. In fact, an, another practical example of where I, I, we found this um, was back in my academic days, because I worked with a very, very clever psychologist who was also a very clever statistician. So being a psychologist and a statistician, he thought, well, you know, I, I can use my skills to work out how to get people attracted to the university department, you know, because university departments get their funding based on getting good students in. So he started asking around and asking students what they thought. And of course, they came back with, well, you know, it's A-levels, it was the A-levels I did, it's the course, it's the location, because the location was in Brighton in, in the UK. Um, it was, you know, the kind of things that they offered the kind of it was a bsc not a ba all that kind of stuff and so we started researching this and not a single thing correlated with who accepted a place so he was rather confused scratched his head for a bit and he thought that's a bit weird the only thing he noticed was that we had various open days over the over the year uh, over the, uh, the year and he noticed that some open days were really successful so he and so that others were really not successful so he went okay fine um let's think about uh, what we do on those open days so where do we take them what information do we give them who do we who do we speaks on those days and again he could find absolutely nothing that correlated with whether people took a place or not so he thought about this for a year or so and then he kind of read a few papers and he came up with kind of this preposterous idea and he thought could it be so the next few years he tested it and he absolutely found that the most predictive thing of people taking a place at a university, a big life decision, was whether they came down on a sunny day or not. If it was raining, they stayed away. If it was sunny, they stayed. So it just shows the kind of even these really big decisions that you, you can take in life can be driven by something that's not only kind of it just felt nice, it's a heuristic, it feels like I might like it here, type vibe, but also that actually people are not necessarily aware and in that case, we're very much not aware of the reason why they were making this big life decision. These university applicants had no idea that the weather actually dictated their decision. In fact, we're all pretty awful at noticing when we use a heuristic. Dan Ariely proved this in a study he conducted on anchoring. 
He asked MIT students to write down the last two numbers of their security code. These numbers are, of course, completely random. Dan then asked the students to bid on an expensive bottle of champagne. Now, every student agreed that their social security number should have no effect on how much they bid. But the results showed that wasn't true. Instead, the students with the highest social security numbers, those numbers ranging from 80 to 99, bid the most on the champagne, while the students with the lowest numbers, 1 to 20, they bid far less. By priming the students to look at their social security number, the students became anchored and their bids were massively influenced by a heuristic. Yet if you ask someone if they'd ever bid differently on an item according to their house number, or if they would ever pick a university based on how sunny it was, they'd pretty much always say no. This raises a really difficult question for the market research industry. Clearly, we're very bad predictors of our own behaviour, so we can't simply ask consumers how they may or may not act in a certain situation. Instead, we have to watch them in the real world or in field experiments. But this can be extremely expensive and time-consuming to do. Virtual reality offers a solution. By placing consumers in a VR headset, we can watch how they really act in a number of scenarios, both quickly and cheaply. And that's where Gorilla in the Room come in. So Gorilla in the Room is a company, a tech company that has been set up to provide virtual reality and augmented reality solutions for the research industry. And what we have is an app that respondents can access virtual and augmented reality experiences through that can be embedded into online surveys and also can be used in qualitative research. Gorilla in the Room have conducted a number of different studies using VR including one which asked participants to sit for a three-hour VR Shakespeare performance. But I was interested in discovering how companies might use this new research to improve their products. So I asked Alistair about how they teamed up with O2, one of the UK's largest mobile networks, to help decide how they design their stores. With O2, what we did was, I mean, they had a challenge because they'd launched this new product in store using a point of sale. And it wasn't, I mean, they'd done it with a few pilot stores, but it wasn't really working the way that they wanted to. So working in collaboration with Populous, we created a, a, we went and actually filmed a store using 360 video. And then from that, we used CGI. We sort of pioneered this kind of CGIing over 360 video and created four other different points of sale. So we changed the copy, we changed the image, we changed the labelling on the uh, on the thing itself. And this was then put out to, we think, the world's first VR panel. And the results came back basically showing that you could tell the, the um, point of sale wasn't getting as much attention as some of the other points of sale within the store. On top of that, you could also sort of get diagnostic information as to why it wasn't working. And predominantly it was because it wasn't communicating terribly well and it was very confusing for respondents, for respondents or consumers because rather ironically and sort of serendipitously um, they had actually put a VR headset on this stand to demonstrate to people what this product was and it was called O2 Home, it was like a, a way to control your home from, from remotely. A bit remotely. Um, but the VR headset was just confusing, people just thought well it, it, it's a VR product but of course it wasn't, it was something entirely different. We were able to diagnose things like that through the test and then sort of come back with recommendations as to how they can improve the point of sale. Using VR, Alistair's team could quickly show potential customers four different versions of the store and discover which point of sale design was most effective. The benefit here is that it's far quicker and far cheaper than building four different versions of the store and shipping participants between them and then asking what they think. On to something slightly different. Do you remember your first beer? If so, you'll probably vividly remember the first sip, the taste, the bitterness, and perhaps the initial dislike. And then, after a few bottles, quite a lot of enjoyment. But drink a beer today, and the experience will be quite different. You'll know exactly what to expect, and you'll probably barely notice the subtle nuances in its taste. This is called prolonged exposure. After a lot of exposure to something, we stop really thinking about it. Well, the same effect happens with ads. The first time we see an ad, assuming it's a good one, we pay a lot of attention. 
but after multiple exposures, we stop noticing it. The million dollar question for advertisers is when will consumers stop paying attention to my ad? Is it after, say, the third viewing, or is it perhaps after the tenth? Knowing that could save advertisers an awful lot of cash. So Gorilla in the Room teamed up with Kinetic to figure it out. So another project we worked on with Kinetic was to answer one of the really big questions that had never been answered, and that was how many times should you see an advert? So what we did was we created, we had actually filmed um, lots of sites, uh, poster sites, uh, out-of-home sites around a city, and then we CGI'd new copy into those sites. And then again, we put it out to a panel, um, a virtual reality research panel, and we showed them between kind of four and 16 times the exposure. Um, and most importantly, we actually didn't tell people what the study was about. We just said, hey guys, we're gonna show you some virtual reality experiences. And what we want you to do is just look around and observe the street scene. So I then used a measure called the mere exposure effect, because in effect, our brains have this wonderful little quirk to them whereby the more we see something, the more we like it, up to a certain number of exposures, and then our brain sort of gets bored with it. So in effect, it's kind of like our brain saying, you need to learn about this, learn about this, learn about this, then get to the point of like, you've learned enough and now don't pay it less attention. Don't bother paying it so much attention. So up until we run this study, the perceived, perceived wisdom was, it was around about kind of seven exposures-ish, seven or eight exposures was about where people should be, so the optimal optimal frequency for ad exposures. Um, but we actually found that it peaked out somewhere around about 10. So it was, you know, 10 to 12, it was considerably higher. So based on that, and this is a very, very robust finding. So based on that, Kinetic have now been able to go back to their clients and to say, actually, we, we should really start thinking about booking out places via, you know, sites by frequency. So rather than thinking about length of time an ad is up, think about the amount of exposures it's going to get. So in a high footfall place, you may want to be up for less time than in a low footfall place. If you're creating an ad campaign, you should aim for it to be seen about 10 times. Now, you might think that this goes against conventional wisdom. Surely if a consumer sees something they like, they'll go ahead and buy it as soon as they see it. But that view ignores a vitally important psychological finding that Alistair mentioned called the mere exposure effect. The mere exposure effect means the more somebody sees something, the more likely they are to develop a preference for it. This phenomenon was first discovered way back in the 1960s by Robert Zayonx. In his experiment, Robert showed Chinese language characters to two groups of Americans. The groups were told that these symbols represented adjectives and were asked to rate whether the symbols held positive or negative connotations. Now, obviously, the participants had no idea what the characters meant, so you would assume they wouldn't have a preference over one or the other. However, the results showed something quite interesting. The symbols the subjects had previously seen were consistently rated more positively than those that they hadn't seen. The familiarity had created a positive connotation. In a similar experiment, people were asked not to rate the connotations of the symbols, but to describe their mood after the experiment. Members of the group with repeated exposure to certain characters reported being in better moods than those without. This mere exposure effect works in ads as well. If the ad becomes familiar, we'll start to like it more, but only up to a certain point. More than 10 exposures and the repetition becomes annoying, a bit like when you listen to your favourite song too much. Alistair's been fascinated about the mere exposure effect throughout his career, for his PhD, he wrote a paper which attempted to see if consumers were even aware if they'd been affected by the mere exposure effect, or if they'd simply assumed that a positive feeling about a brand was something they always had. In that paper, um, the key observation was that when you're doing ad testing, what you're asking people to do is to have an experience and then consciously mentally reconstruct that experience in its absence. And as a guy who did kind of, you know, 10, 12 years as an academic looking at what's called implicit memory, I knew that there was a lot more information in there than what people were able to consciously mentally reconstruct. And one of the processes that I used was this attribution paradigm to be able to pull apart different kinds of memory. So what that means is that if you see an ad, 
you can actually pull apart the bits that are consciously mentally reconstructed from the ad and pull apart that memory from some other things. So I realized that you could pull these two apart using this, this process that you described. But in effect, you ask people about a brand on day one and then show them the ad. So you say, hey, what do you think about this brand? They give you a whole bunch of brand information. You give them a, an experience done with ad testing normally, but I've done lots of different things. I did, blimey, I, I did the first ever electoral debate between Cameron Brown and Nick Clegg um, many years ago using this process. But then on the second day, rather than, you know, you normally give it a day because memory takes a little bit of time to bed in. Um, eight hours is normally what's quoted, but that's a very variable figure. But the next day is normally pretty good. So you then do two tests you basically ask them the same kind of questions about the brand and say okay now i've shown you an ad about this brand so now consciously mentally reconstruct that ad and add in everything you can recall from that moment that you've seen the ad so everything that you knew already but now add in everything that you can recall from the ad and they answer a whole bunch of questions and then you say the, the sort of the, the tricky and the sort of the cheeky thing is okay now tell me what you think you knew before you saw the ad. So now consciously mentally, re mentally reconstruct that ad, but then ignore it all, forget it. Don't worry about it. And of course, if you, you know, if our memories were perfect, you'd expect one and three to be exactly the same, but of course they never are and things shift around massively. So back in the long lost days of the first electoral debate, the, the, the big sort of uh, thing at the time was that nobody, everybody had sort of really thought about um, Nick Clegg as being, you know, not really thought about him. They don't thought about Cameron and Brown as being the sort of the Tory and the Labour leaders. And we had a whole bunch of people on day one, so, so basically saying, who's Nick Clegg? And then on day three saying, oh, yeah, I knew about him. I knew all about him. And that to me is a really powerful way to understand how communications work, because it is a genuine and real measure of how ads can persuade in an unconscious way. So you can actually measure a whole bunch of stuff that ads do that respondents are not aware they've been or are not aware that they've taken on board. Voters in the UK's 2010 general election originally said they had no idea who Nick Clegg was. But just a day later, they went on to say they've always liked him. The mere exposure effect doesn't just generate positive connotations, it actually alters our memory as well. If you find yourself on the verge of making a big life decision, perhaps buying a house or deciding to marry your partner, maybe wait and see how you feel on a day when the sun isn't shining. And if you're trying to figure out why your customers constantly rave about your competitor's product, perhaps ask how many times they've seen their competitor's ads. I'd like to give Dr. Alistair Good a massive thank you for coming on the show. If you want to find out more about his company, Gorilla in the Room, give it a search on Google or click the link in the show notes. And if you've enjoyed learning the strange ways our brains operate, then sign up for our email list. I'll send you an email every time we release a new podcast so you'll never miss a show. In fact, the first 50 people who sign up will be entered into a draw to win a copy of The Choice Factory by Richard Shotton. So go ahead and sign up now to have a chance of winning that. The link to our mailing list is in the show notes below. Anyway, thank you again for listening to this episode of Nudge. Thank you.